I chose the five worst things about the Star Wars sequels, and in this video, I'll explain what they are and why they're so bad. Narrowing the list down to the top five was a challenge within of itself, from the bad writing, to the massive plot holes, to the beloved characters that they ruined along the way. Given all that, it was stunningly hard to take all of the flaws and disappointments and pick the absolute worst of the bunch, since there were so many things to choose from. And I guarantee that there are some, like the last one in this video, that you've never even thought of before. But once I explain it to you, you won't be able to unsee it, and it'll haunt you forever. And by the way, these are not in any particular order. All right, without further ado, let's get into the video. We're starting off number one with the bane of every true Star Wars fan's existence, Rey. I think that it's safe to say that Rey is one of the most hated characters in all of Star Wars. Funny, never really thought that this guy would have any competition. The main reason that most people don't like Rey is because she's an overpowered Mary Sue. She can pull random abilities out of nowhere, like force healing and intergalactic zoom calls. She was extremely talented with a lightsaber from the moment she picked one up, and for everyone about to comment, no, being skilled with a two-handed metal stick has absolutely no bearing on your skill with a sword. It's like saying that I'm a world-class fencer, and so therefore, I'm exceptionally good at nunchucks. A staff and a sword are two entirely different weapons. I'm not saying that being skilled with one wouldn't complement the other, but to say that being competent with one makes you equally competent with the other is just lunacy. Anyway, back to my overall point. Rey also beats Kylo Ren, who we believe to be a skilled duelist and force user, the first time that they meet. If she wins the first duel that she fights, what possible challenge is there for her to overcome? I mean, the first time Luke went up against Vader, he got a surprise amputation and almost fell to his death. So it gave Luke a purpose and made his second duel with Vader way more tense and interesting. Meanwhile, Rey just absolutely rolls through anybody who stands in her way, and it never feels like she has to work for it. And that leads me to my final point. Rey never has to work for anything. With almost all of the other protagonists in Star Wars, they have flaws and shortcomings that they need to overcome. Anakin is prone to anger and tempted by the dark side, and you'd better believe it takes him a while to overcome that. He also isn't trusted by the people around him, despite how long they've known him. Luke is extremely arrogant and quick to act, and he pays the price for it, like I said earlier, receiving a free prosthetic replacement. But he overcomes his arrogance in the end, showing the growth that he's had throughout his journey. Now, let's look at Rey. Rey is kind patient, loyal, calm, righteous, and extremely competent. On top of that, she's also completely trusted by everyone she encounters and is never bested at anything by anyone for the most part. Look, if you liked Rey and found her to be a good character, then I'm happy for you. I'm glad that at least some people found her presence to be a good thing. But it seems like to me that most Star Wars fans don't like Rey and don't find her to be a good character in any way whatsoever for all of the reasons listed previously. But anyway, that's all I gotta say about her. It's time to move on to number two, the absolutely terrible villains of the sequels. Let me ask you this, can you think of one villain in the Star Wars sequels who was actually cool, intimidating, scary, and ruthless? Let's go through them one by one and see if any of them meet that criteria. Kylo Ren could have actually been a really cool villain, but they made him so weak and whiny and wishy-washy and indecisive. Plus, since the sequels are basically a game of tug of war between J.J. Abrams and Ryan Johnson, his character keeps getting changed. Is he on the side of the resistance? Because after all, he did kill Snoke, and <laughs> don't worry, I'll talk about Snoke in a second. Or is he plotting the resistance's downfall? Because why else would to take Palpatine's fleet of Star Destroyer Death Star mutants. He keeps flip-flopping this way and that and helping Rey, then betraying her, then helping her again. So he's not a competent villain. Also, any potential allure that he might have had when we first saw him was shattered when Rey beat him the literal first time she picked up a lightsaber. If you can defeat the villain the first time you confront them, then what challenge is there for you to overcome? I mean, you've already reached the final obstacle and you've overcome it. Boom, story over. So that kind of eliminates Kylo Ren as a potential villain. Okay, so what about Hux? Well, General Hux could have been a cool cool Grand Moff Tarkin-like figure. I made a YouTube short about this, but he obviously was dedicated to the First Order because you'd have to be to blow up like nine planets. But then two developments came along that made him no longer be good villain material. First, he got turned into a walking joke when Snoke made him into a mop in front of his own men. And when he became the butt of every single joke in The Last Jedi, holy cow, it got so old. I get it, Poe Dameron's flipping him off and saying his mom's fat or whatever. It's not funny. And now, he's no longer good villain material, because if the writers don't respect him, then neither will the viewers. And second, he was a spy? How? He was dedicated to the First Order. He was obedient and would do whatever it took to get to the top. And then he just turned traitor out of the blue? Well, maybe there was a really killer reason for it. Oh, he just didn't really like Kylo Ren. I see. Anyway, that's all to say that Hux isn't really a villain material anymore. 
On to Supreme Leader Snoke. Ah, good old Snokey boy. You know, back when The Force Awakens came out and Snoke was just a big cloudy face in the room, I liked him a lot. He was cool, intimidating, and scary. And when we see him in The Last Jedi, and whoa, he's powerful with the Force. I mean, he's flinging Rey around like she's nothing. Maybe he will be the big bad guy she has to overcome. Ah, frick, he just took the Darth Maul way out. Well, he's not an option anymore. I mean, honestly, what did Ryan Johnson expect to do for a villain in the final movie? It is a trilogy after all. Who did he think was gonna step up? And of course, the answer is no one. Or so he thought. But there was one lurking in the shadows, being the puppet master behind the scenes, altering the Star Wars universe beyond our sight. <clears throat> the villain that no one saw coming. <clears throat> the one, the only, Darth Jar Jar! <sighs> no. Did not exactly happen that way, unfortunately. JJ made the executive decision to throw cities back into the mix, which was almost insufferably hard to watch. It was weird because they never even tried to explain how Palpatine survived his fall down a thousand foot pit in an exploding space station, which, and correct me if I'm wrong, kind of seemed like vital information. All we got was one throwaway line about cloning, and believe you me, that was not even close to enough information to explain how this happened. And since Palpatine had come out of left field, there was literally no tension between him and Rey, and that really made their final confrontation, um, sorry, their one and only confrontation, feel really empty and shallow. I mean, I've literally felt more stress at casual family dinners than I have during this scene. And also, side note, not really a big deal, but CGI much, JJ? When I was watching this for the first time in theaters, I almost laughed out loud. What the heck is his head doing? I seem to remember in The Revenge of the Sith, when he got zapped with Force Lightning before, it merely disfigured him. But now it's literally tearing the flesh from his body because, what, she has two lightsabers now? Pretty sure that's not how Force Lightning works, JJ. Anyway, that doesn't really matter. What I'm trying to say is that the Star Wars sequels are desperately lacking good villains, and the ones that they try to give us lack any of the intimidation of Vader, the classiness of Dooku, or the deviousness of Palpatine. Uh, this Palpatine, not this Palpatine. Number three on the list is the utter lack of world building, which, put simply, means the absence of universe expansion. Eh, I guess that's not exactly simple, but the point is, the Star Wars sequels really failed to take the universe that George Lucas built and make it more vast and more immersive. I mean, just look at the originals and the prequels. Every single movie adds dozens of new things to the Star Wars galaxy, and at the very least, one really unique planet in each movie. Like, actually sit down and think about it for a sec. A New Hope has desert, Empire Strikes Back has snow, Return of the Jedi has forest, Phantom Menace has Countryside, Attack of the Clones has Water, and Revenge of the Sith has Lava. Say all you want about the prequel's bad dialogue, but you simply can't argue that they don't expand the universe, because they really do. And not just in terms of planets, but in technology, cultures, and alien species. Now contrast all of that. Everything I just said with the Star Wars sequels. Take a look at the world. There's not one thing that I can think of that is really unique and expansive and creative, with the possible exception of Exegol. And of course, can't forget my homeboy Claude. Really knocked it out of the park with that one, JJ. Way to go. If you think Claude should have been the main character of the sequels, then hit that subscribe button, because we're on the same page here. I wholeheartedly believe that in an even duel, Claude would one-tap Ray like it was nothing. Sorry, my absolute love for Claude has clouded my vision. Back to the video. Krayt is basically Hoth and was designed with the sole purpose of being a throwback to Hoth. Yes, I know it's salt. The movie showed us like every two seconds so we wouldn't forget, but come on. We all know that it was basically Hoth. Jakku is basically Tatooine. Kanto Bite is a copy and paste of Naboo, and I remember very vividly watching the Force Awakens trailer back in 2015 and 10-year-old me saying out loud to my dad, look, they have Kashyyyk, when they showed that shot of Poe Dameron flying over the water on Takodana. Now, I'm sure that some of you are murmuring right now that there isn't anything left for the sequels to use because George Lucas used it all up. But let me just say, if you look at the Clone Wars, there are some absolutely wild planets that are nothing like the climates that we have in the real world. There's Dathomir, Umbara, Christophus, and that's just scratching the surface. I mean, there are so many cool things that you could have made if you had any creativity, which to be fair, I know Disney doesn't. And that's just talking about planets. Look at the technology. I think I mentioned this in an older video that I made, but the only technology in the sequels that is separate from what we have in the originals and prequels is the bombers from The Last Jedi, the weird ski things from the Battle of Krayt, and the ground speeders from The Rise of Skywalker. And every single one of those is a complete downgrade of technology from what they had in the prequels and the originals. Here, let's go over those really quick. The Rebel Bombers, which were in the beginning of The Last Jedi, are really illogical because they're incredibly slow and they need to get directly over their target before they can release their bombs, which also doesn't make sense because how would bombs fall in space since there's no gravity? Unless I'm completely wrong, I'm pretty sure ships aren't big enough to have their own gravitational field, and even if they are and I'm wrong, there's literally not one single good reason to not use Y-Wings, which are made to be bombers in the first place and can actually shoot their bombs at high speeds directly at their target from a reasonable distance. Like in Rogue 
Rogue One, they literally took down a Star Destroyer. So I'm not sure why they couldn't use those. The ski speeders on Crate are stupid, not only because of their horrible design, but because of the fact that the Resistance, for some reason, used them to go out to meet the First Order head on. What, what were they hoping to achieve? They're, they're charging giant four-legged walkers with guns and ships that could shoot from the sky with basically one-legged trash compactors. And then before they even get there, they turn around. It's actually beyond stupid. And finally, the ground speeders from the Rise of Skywalker are ridiculous because they have treads, which are possibly the slowest form of wheels to exist because they have so much area to cover in order to move forward. The amount of friction slowing them down is absolutely insane. On top of that, things can easily get caught in the treads, which will then cause the speeders to erupt in a fiery explosion. And also, to add icing to the cake, basic speeders, like the ones we see in Return of the Jedi, are much more practical because, since they have zero friction to overcome, come, they can move much faster. So the few technological differences in the sequels aren't even upgrades as they should be, because the sequels are set 30 years in the future, they're entirely downgrades. And the worst part about this whole shebang is that it would have been really easy to make cool new tech that was actually new and unique. Maybe instead of the Resistance using the old X-Wings painted black and orange, they used a different model of ship entirely. That could be cool. Or what if the First Order had ships that weren't the TIE Fighters? These all would have been very simple changes that wouldn't have impacted the story as a whole, almost at all, but would have still made the universe feel bigger and more expansive, and just given the Star Wars galaxy some more depth. Ah well, what a wasted opportunity. And yet, it still isn't as big of a wasted opportunity as the final point of this video is, which is gonna come up in a few minutes, so stick around until then. For now, just sit back, hit that subscribe button, and let's talk about number four, this guy. Or should I say, more accurately, this guy. Yep, you guessed it. Next up on the list is the destruction of Luke Skywalker's character. Disney took Luke's character from the original trilogy and decided that the best course of action was to completely change it, like in every way. Luke was always a confident, eager, and dedicated person in the originals, who never gave up even when things got hard and always did what was right. Then, in the sequels, he becomes a grumpy old man who makes one mistake that he would never have made and decides that instead of actually doing something about it, he's just gonna exile himself and hang out alone on an island until he dies. But Jebbard, why would he leave a map to his location if he didn't want to be fa- You know what, they just kind of forgot about that after The Force Awakens, so I'm just gonna do that too. There was no map, Luke Skywalker didn't want to be found, he wanted to die. End of story. This is one change that Disney made that I don't think anybody really likes. I took a poll a while back Back, and out of the 1,000 people that voted, 420 of them, <laughs> funny number, said that the treatment of Luke Skywalker was their least favorite part of the sequels. And sure, it was a completely rigged audience, because anyone who actually likes the sequels would never subscribe to me in a million years. Out of all the things that Disney did to Star Wars, the treatment of Luke Skywalker was one of the worst things to a lot of fans. The really sad thing is that Luke didn't have to go out like this. There was a way for Ryan Johnson to still maintain Luke's character and still have the arc that he wanted to go the exact same way. It was very simple. Just flip the reason that Luke exiled himself onto its head. One of the more prominent reasons that everyone hates Luke now is because he was going to kill Ben Solo off of nothing but bad vibes. That's quite literally it. This from the guy who saved the biggest lunatic in the galaxy because he felt the good in him? No way. But what if, instead, the opposite happened? Luke went against his gut and was too trusting of Ben Solo, failing to see the darkness in Ben rising and not noticing the influence that Snoke had on him. Then Luke goes off on a quest or something and in his absence, Ben does his thing, destroying the temple and killing anyone who won't join with him. Then Luke returns and he is heartbroken and furious with himself for ignoring the signs. He proceeds to go off to the island, left there till Rey finds him. I still don't think that Luke Skywalker would just let other people handle his failure, and I think he'd probably set out to find Ben and try to redeem him, but this story right here still gives Ryan Johnson most of what he wants without completely destroying Luke's character. Anyway, I think that's just about everything I wanted to say about sequel Luke. It's time to move on to the final point of this video. I guarantee that most of you haven't thought of this. What the heck has happened to the galaxy? And that's a real question. What has happened in the 30 years since the Empire fell. Like, what has changed? What is different? What is the same? All right, let's go over what we do know. From the opening crawl for The Force Awakens, we know that the First Order arose from the ashes of the Empire, and there's a Republic that authorized the Resistance to be formed. Okay, that's all the background we get for the entire sequel trilogy. So looking at just the three sequels, as most average Star Wars fans would, having not read the books or anything, I know I certainly haven't, how about we just ask a couple of questions? First of all, how strong is the First Order? Are they some minor terrorist cell, or are they an enormous faction? How strong is the Republic? Public. How much control does it have over the galaxy? How many planets are allied with it? And based on those two things, what is the Republic's relation to the First Order? Does it acknowledge its existence? Does it let it conquer planets in the Outer Rim as long as it leaves the core of the Republic alone? And if the Republic is willing to send a small resistance force to fight it, then why are they not willing to send the entire power of their army or navy? See, by not giving the story the background that it so desperately needs, it makes the overall plot way 
harder to understand, and there simply isn't context as to why the movies are even happening in the first place. But that's just based off of the opening crawl of the first movie. When you actually dive into it, it gets way worse. For example, based on this line of thinking, it makes you completely question the role of Starkiller Base. Let me ask you this. When the First Order blew up, let's say maybe nine planets max, was that the entire Republic? Because if it was, then that would give the plot of The Last Jedi a little more context. I mean, it makes sense that the First Order would chase down the last cell of people that resist their cause. But let's say the First Order only blew up half of the Republic planets, or a third of them. If there are any Republic forces left, what on Earth, or in the galaxy, is stopping them from declaring all-out war on the First Order? I mean, imagine if Russia just went ballistic and sent 10 nuclear missiles at 10 major countries. It stands to reason that every other country on Earth that could fight would band together faster than my sisters would after I shoot one of them with a Nerf gun. I mean, why wouldn't they? It makes sense to obliterate the threat before the threat obliterates us. But that's the problem. We don't know. We don't know if the Republic still exists. We don't know if the First Order is a massive force, and we don't know what the point of the Resistance is if the Republic exists. And hey, just for funsies, why don't I throw a new one into the mix? Why does Kylo Ren need Palpatine's arsenal of Star Destroyers? It's a good question. Is the First Order low on funds? Because there's no indication of that. Do they lack ships? Because there's also no indication of that. Did they forget how to build a super laser? Or do they just not know how to make one without using a whole entire planet? The point is, Disney provides us with no real background for anything happening in the sequels. It makes it so that if you really look at it logically, without reading any of the books or any exterior content, nothing holds up to scrutiny. And that's kind of the general sentiment that I would apply to most of Disney Star Wars. If you really look at what they're doing, it doesn't make sense. Here, I'll give you another example. Disney likes to do this thing where it takes beloved fan favorite characters, makes new, unnecessary content about them, and in that content completely changes the character. It alters who they are entirely. I mean, a prime example of this is Luke Skywalker in the sequel trilogy. But unfortunately, Luke Skywalker wasn't the only one to fall victim to the Disney guillotine. Other big names, such as Boba Fett, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and even Darth Vader himself, have since had their character dragged through the mud by Disney. To really get a deeper understanding of what I'm talking about, you need to check out this video right here. It really dives in deeper to what happened to these beloved characters, and how exactly Disney corrupted them for their own nefarious gains. 